Are you saved? I remember going to youth retreats as a kid with my friends from other denominations. Now these larger gatherings usually ended in an altar call where you were asked if you were saved and told to raise your hand if you felt that you have asked Christ into your heart. Now others who had not done this were asked to come forward and accept Christ as your personal Savior. Now, most of my friends would walk up, including myself, whether we were Christian or not, because we felt that if we didn't, we would burn in hell, mainly because the leaders all but said that to us. And this is why I walked up those first times. I remember very specifically a youth event led by the power team. I don't know if they're still around anymore. This was a group of strong men who would lift heavy objects, do amazing feats of strength, and basically perform an amazing fun show for teenagers. At the end of it, one of the leaders would get up and give a testimony about accepting Jesus. There was always a story about a youth who didn't walk forward and died in a car crash going home that night. I kid you not. I heard that a couple different times. Now, I'm not sure if that ever happened or not. It may have. But the charisma of the speaker, coupled with the young, impressionable minds, led to a very emotional response that I feel was made out of desperation and fear. My friends and I walked up, accepted Christ, which I felt I had done many times before. I was raised in the church, baptized as a baby, went through confirmation class, felt I had done everything that I needed to up until that point. After we walked up, accepted Christ, we cried, we left to go home, and that was it. There was really no compassion from the leaders after they received another notch in their salvation belt, as I would say. Now, I had other experiences in college where leaders from campus ministry would talk about leading people to Christ as a badge of honor, as if they did all the work, leaving out giving God uh, glory for someone coming to Christ. Even if they said it was from God, you could tell that the emphasis was pride that they had done something. Now, this was my experience. It led to where I am today, and I acknowledge that. I'm not sure I would be working in church without those types of experiences. I may have, but my viewpoint is much different than it was back then. I think for myself, and I have read Scripture more, and have studied more, and have come to different conclusions about salvation. Like I said, my experience, not everyone else's, my experience led me to deeper questions about faith, about Christ, about salvation. I would think, is this all there is? A one-time confession and you're good to go. I would think questions like, why hasn't any of the leaders contacted me after the fact? Do they really care about new disciples or who I am and what I'm going through? Or do they just care about getting people saved? Again, my experience. There's a whole spectrum of this type of thing, and I'm sure there are plenty of other examples. What's your story of salvation? If someone asked me today if I were saved, I would have a much better answer than I did as a 14-year-old at a Power a Team event. I am saved by grace through faith in Jesus. I don't understand it fully, but I accept it humbly. I feel I'm not alone in my salvation. I feel God has done an amazing thing in the person of Jesus Christ that I really am too naive to fully understand. I believe salvation comes from God and God alone. I don't have the authority to say who is in and who is out. I try to treat others as children of God who are loved and cared for just as I believe I am. I don't feel my salvation is based on one event in my life. I believe it is based on the cross and the empty tomb, something I had no control over. I believe it is a gift in its truest form as if giving a gift to a toddler or an infant who has no idea what is happening besides pure joy of receiving the gift. To me, it's never just a yes or no answer. In our study guide for today, and I encourage you to read it, biblical salvation comes 
in a few different forms. One is salvation as caring. Think about the story of God providing manna and water to the freed rescue slaves in the wilderness. In this act, God saves his people by caring for their basic needs. Salvation also comes in the form of rescue. Rescue from Pharaoh. Rescue from oppression. Rescue from sin. Now, sin can be viewed in two different ways, according to Paul Tillich, who is a contemporary theologian. The first way is with a big S, capital S-I-N, sin, which relates to being separated from God, estranged from God, or turning away from God. So, an absence of God. We talked about that in my study on what the Bible really says about hell. And then the other view is with a lowercase s, which are individual sins, like lying and cheating and stealing and murder. Think about like the Ten Commandments. What is your viewpoint on what happened on the cross and resolved with the empty tomb? What does that mean to you? What did that mean to the early church? I'm going to read a section from our handout that you can read on our website about the Apostle Paul's idea on salvation. This is on page 2 of the handout, and the heading is Salvation by Faith. It says, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's from Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Paul was adamant that salvation comes only through faith in Christ. There is nothing a person can do to earn God's grace except to believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior. That's from Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Now, Christians well versed in the idea of salvation, the doctrine of salvation by grace, sometimes misunderstand what Paul meant by it. As a result, being saved can begin to sound to some people rather trite and shallow. When Paul said that the law does not save, in in Galatians chapter 2 and 3, many scholars point out that he was referring to the Jewish covenant of circumcision and dietary restrictions. Paul argued that Gentiles did not have to follow these laws to become Christian because circumcision did not save. That's what a lot of the letter to the Galatians is about. Now, Paul did not mean that those who accept Christ can do whatever they please. Through merely following commandments, though merely following commandments does not save, Paul still expected those who converted to Christianity to strive to do good, serve the community, and heal the world. A Christian might be saved from sin and set on the right path to a relationship with God, but it was still quite possible to commit sin. So, in this brief section, it kind of goes away from the idea of salvation as a one-time act. It goes closer to the idea that salvation is a process, that salvation is more about just getting into heaven after you die. Salvation relates a lot to how we live on this earth and how we can bring healing and peace and joy to the world through our faith. That is one idea of biblical salvation. Now, Christians have and will debate salvation for a long time. There's too many nuances and Bible verses you can use to defend a particular viewpoint to not have debates. Here are some viewpoints on salvation. I'm not saying these are good or bad or these are particularly what I believe in. I'm just saying that these are some that I have heard over the years, that are some are that are in the leader's guide, and some that you may have heard too. So just think about these different viewpoints and think about the spectrum of the idea of salvation across Christianity. Number one, you have to say the Jesus prayer which is something along the lines of, Jesus, I believe in you, forgive me of my sins, and come into my heart before you can be accepted into heaven. Number two, you have to ask for forgiveness of every sin or you will not be welcome into heaven because you are dirty from sin or unclean. Number three, we are saved by faith alone. We don't have to do anything else. Faith in Christ and you're covered. Number four, only doing good acts shows that you are saved. 
So while you may have faith in Christ, if you don't do anything with it, then you're really not saved. Number five, being saved is not a one-time act. It is a process. Kind of relates to number four, doesn't it? Number six, if you don't accept Christ, you are damned to hell. Kind of relates to the first one, just maybe in a different nuanced way. Which one of those did you grow up with? Or there a combination of them? Has your perspective changed or evolved over the years as you've grown in your faith? Is there another viewpoint that I didn't say? How does your viewpoint compare to the person of Christ? What Bible verses inform your viewpoint of salvation? Questions, questions, and more questions. Salvation is a big topic. When someone asks you or you were saved, it is important to have a confident answer because sometimes their question is a loaded statement. Now, I'm not all about just getting into an argument about what Bible verse is better or if you start spouting out Bible verses, they're going to spout out Bible verses too. This is not about getting into arguments with other Christians. It's more about having confidence that God is God, and that we are not, and that God is our Savior, God is our salvation, and God is love. Those are some universal things that I hold on to that give me confidence in my salvation. What are some things that give you confidence and peace in your life? Now, yesterday for my Wednesday devotion, I gave the answer in our study catechism to the question, will all human beings be saved? It's an interesting answer from a Presbyterian perspective. You can go and watch that on Facebook or YouTube. It's only about seven minutes long. Now, salvation is from God and God alone. We believe in a God who is gracious, who died for us, who forgives us when we don't deserve it. In closing, think about how big is God's salvation to you and to the world? How does your answer affect your discipleship? Does it humble you or does it make you prideful? Read, pray, and think about this topic today. What is God telling you? Let's close in prayer. God of life and God of salvation, we thank you for saving us. Help us to not control you or your plan Humble us as we walk beside you and help us to point to you in our deeds and in our words. Forgive us when we sin. Help us to forgive others more. In Christ I pray, amen. So like I mentioned earlier, this is going to be our last Theology Thursday study in this cycle. I'll pick up other topics in the future. I just need some more time to plan ahead. These take a little bit of time to make and prepare for. I hope you've enjoyed these videos and these topics. I've enjoyed making them and we'll make more in the future. I will continue the Wednesday devotions, so watch those on Facebook and YouTube. And check out our other videos from Alice and Mark and Mike. We got a huge spectrum of things from music and devotion and Bible study and theology to keep us connected and keep us thinking when we can't have in-person study for now. Go in peace.